Let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. Hopefully you have a Bible with you. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. I've entitled this today, The Only One Who Can Control the Environment. We're living in interesting days in the last 30 years. There's been a lot of talk about the environment, and, and you're, now you're looking at somebody who doesn't believe in trashing the environment. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, it bothers me, still bothers me to this day when I'm driving behind someone and they throw trash out the window. Uh, they should know better than that. Shouldn't be doing that or uh, ruining our lakes and streams and so forth. We're, we're for taking care of what God has given us. But folks, there's a difference between taking care of it and thinking that we have the ability to save it. Amen. Okay, or we have the ability to, uh, through our behavior modification, we have the ability to uh, uh, deliver the planet from uh, our destruction, so to speak. Let me, let me just share this with you today. If you're wondering if earth is going to survive, earth is going to survive as long as God wants it to. A day is coming when God is, according to the Bible, and we'll get there someday, we'll get there if the rapture doesn't take place, the Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and 22. But um, uh, God is at that point going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. In the meantime... Don't even be concerned about global warming, okay? Because the only one who's going to warm up the earth is God. It's one of the judgments he's going to pour out on the earth in the near future during the tribulation period. Uh, man is not warming the earth. Now, uh, now listen, I'm a, don't, don't be offended by that. Maybe you're, you're into that. Don't be offended by what I just said. Let me just tell you, though, I'm, I'm sharing with you the big picture. Okay, and, and if perchance, you know, there are those who say, well, we're, the global warming's going on, and then there's the other ones who will say, well, you know what, no global cooling is actually, we've reached, an, we've reached a point now to where that's reversed, and there's actually ice being built up instead of uh, going away and all these kind of things. And then we get these crazy ideas that, that we think, well, you know what, if I just put a, a new kind of device on my car, that will take care of it. Um, you know, friend, listen, it's way bigger than that. You know what our problem is? Our problem isn't the environment. Our problem is self-importance. That's our problem. See, we're th we think we're God. This planet's too big for man to fix or to salvage. It's, it's God who is in control of these things. Now, again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying let's trash the planet. I don't believe in that. I don't think it's God's will for us to do that. I think he wants us to uh, take care of it and respect it because it's something he created, okay? You don't take something that somebody has made and trash it. You know, if one of your kids came up to you with an art project and you looked at it, mommy, mommy, look at this, or daddy, daddy, look at this, and you look and say, yeah, let me put it on the floor and just stomp it, all right? And let me wreck it. Now, you'd never do that. Well, you know what? God doesn't want us doing that with his planet. But, but, the only one who can control the environment is God. It's God. So keep that in mind, okay? Now, in our study through Revelation, we've seen that there is a day soon coming when the Lord, God, is going to start pouring out His wrath on the earth. That day is coming. And we've already covered in previous messages on this the issue of, well, you know, all this injustice, all this wickedness in the world, all this killing and maiming and, 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 and uh, uh, abuse, uh, physical abuse and sexual abuse and all these things that are, that are going on. Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't he do something? Well, a day is coming when he is going to do something, but he does not operate, folks, nor does he hop at our command. He has his own calendar of events, and it's up to us to properly respond to what he says, okay? You may be here today, and you might say, well, I think, dear friend, listen, I'm glad that you think, and we should think, but can I tell you, with all due respect, our opinions do not matter when it comes to what God has ordained. 
It is not going to change it whatsoever. Okay? You need to get away from the self, self-importance and instead bow the knee to the God of heaven. By the way, isn't that a great title? But the God of heaven, as it says in the Old Testament. I love that. See, the day will come when God is going to start pouring out his wrath on the earth. All the mocking and ridicule towards God and the Bible will finally be dealt with. Now, I don't know about you, there's a side of me that really likes that. You know? I don't know if I'm supposed to or not, but I do. Like, yeah, you know, get them. These, these arrogant people about, you know, who mock God and I uh, think of the the, the Bill Maurer, Mayor, Mar, whatever, Bill Maher, I think is his name. You know, that smug look on his face, always attacking Christianity and mocking it, making fun of it. Dear friend, let me tell you something. You're in for a rude awakening. God is going to step in and start doing things on this planet that will be literally shocking and frightening. See, we call this coming day the tribulation period. Before this, it's seven years long. Before this takes place, though, the Lord is going to take all of those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior to heaven. We call that the rapture of the church. We've spent a lot of time on this already, so we're not going to go there. I'm just giving you a thumbnail uh, review. Uh, that, that rapture of the church, it's for all those who have trusted Christ alone as their Savior, who understand being religious won't save them, doing good works won't save them, reforming their life won't save them, okay, promising things won't save them, signing up for noble cause won't save them. The only thing that will save you from hell to heaven is trusting in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross and paid for all of your sins. You're putting your faith in him and him alone to get you to heaven, okay? Yes, yes, all your eggs in one basket. That's how you get to heaven, okay? There's no two baskets. Jesus is the only one who can get you there. Now, we saw in chapter 6 the sealed book or scroll was starting to be open and judgments were beginning to be poured out on the earth in chapter 6. Then chapter 7, God said, okay, before we continue, let me tell you about my plan for world evangelism. And that plan for world evangelism is what we call the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, all men who have never known a woman physically, and these are going to be going out all over the earth, uh, both physically and possibly very much, uh, very possibly through media as well, could be doing it. Uh, we don't know all the different ways it's going to happen, but the word is going to be getting out. They're going to be preaching. Multitudes upon multitudes are going to put their faith in Christ. Now, these 144,000 are going to be sealed by God in their forehead. People will know who they are because that seal of God in their forehead is contrary to the mark of the beast. The Antichrist, which will be either on the back of the hand or on the forehead. Stark contrast, all right? Now, those who trust Christ as Savior through the ministry of the 144,000, my, my understanding in the Scriptures, they are not going to be sealed, and they are going to be subject to incredible persecution and, yes, martyrdom. And we talked in detail about that last week. It's going to be an awful time, unprecedented martyrdom of these people. They are going to be hunted like, like hardened criminals, okay? They're going to, the world is going to be after them. Families are going to be turning in their own loved ones and, and turning on them, and all these kind of things are going to be taking place. Now, that's a terrible thing in itself, but after we, we see that picture painted in chapter 7, then the chapter 8 picks up where chapter 6 left off. Now, if anything is clear, it is, in, it is this. God is in control of the world in which we live. All right? God is in control of the world in which we live. You know, people say, well, well you know, global, global warming is going to bring the water level of the oceans up, and then Florida is going to be completely covered over with water and, and all these other things, and, oh, what are we going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll quit driving my SUV, and that'll save the planet. No. If everybody quit driving SUVs, it won't save the planet. God is in control of the earth, not 
man. Again, we're, we're too big. We got, our thoughts are too big on ourselves. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. No scheme of man can control the environment or save the planet. As a matter of fact, God will not allow man to save the planet. Because God says, I'm giving you what I am going to do to the planet. And man has no control over it whatsoever. I know that's, listen, I know those are direct, shocking, strong statements especially for an unbelieving world to hear. But it's my job to make them and to speak them and to let you know and to warn you of what is coming in the future. Chapter 8, verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, the seventh seal, okay, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Now just stop and think about that. You know, there are times in our world when tragedies take place. After that, at large gatherings, such as sporting events or patriotic things and so forth, they will have, they'll say, well, let's, let's observe a moment of silence to remember the tragedy and the lives lost and, and all these kind of things. And so... The, such as at a stadium or something. And, there, and so there will be a moment of silence. Now, I don't know about you, if, if, if it's like a, a, a longer moment of silence, it seems like it goes on forever. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, you know what I'm talking about. When everybody is quiet, completely quiet, that period of time seems to go on for a long time. Here in chapter 8, there's a quote-unquote moment of silence, and it is a half an hour long. Now think about that. Half an hour. Why? Well, I can tell you what I think. I believe it is because what is coming is so incredibly shocking, everybody stands still in awe. Everybody stops. Everything stops. By the way, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, everybody's busy and this and that, and you hear somebody shout and everybody stops and looks? The events, when this seal is open and it is seen what is coming, everybody is just... for half an hour. If I did it for a minute, you'd start getting antsy. Imagine a half an hour, but this actually takes place in heaven. Verse 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel uh, came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up, before God out of the angel's hand. Question for you today. Could these prayers consist of asking the Lord for justice to be served on the evildoers of the world? Could they include a prayer such as, Thy kingdom come to the earth. Thy will be done. I think there's a possibility of that. I really do. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now this is similar to the results of the seventh trumpet judgment over in chapter 11, verse 19, where it says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. It's also similar to the seventh vial or bold judgment that we find in chapter 16, verse 18, where it says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. 
Let me share this with you. Now, I love, I have high respect for the commentators of the past. I think they're the best Bible commentators that have ever lived, the commentators of the past. Those are the ones I read, okay? I don't go to most contemporary commentaries. I don't usually go there unless they're, they're quoting the guys from the past. So why not go to the guys of the past? But you know what's interesting to me? I find some that I deeply respect theologically, some of the great Bible teachers of the past, they get the, the book of Revelation and the judgments, and they say they're symbolic, that they're not literal, and that they're not literally um, physiological tragedies that are going to be taking place on the earth. I strongly disagree with that. We just simply must take these at face value. You know, folks, because they're so overwhelming, we have a tendency to say, well, they can't be literal. I mean, these things are just too overwhelming and devastating. But wait a minute. This is the language God gave it to us. Until, so until we know differently, we need to accept it as it is. Isn't that the way we approach the rest of the Bible? It's the way we should. I believe it. I believe it exactly as it's written. Now, fire, as we have seen already in Revelation, is a sign or a symbol of God's judgment, okay? He always judges with fire, the fire of his indignation, the fire of judgment, and, and so forth, okay? Revelation 8, verse 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So the seven angels start, and each of them has a trumpet, and every time a trumpet goes off, a new judgment is going to be poured out on the earth. Verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So the first one, what do we see? Hail and fire mingled with blood. Now there is no reason not to take these judgments literally. They're very similar, by the way, to the plagues that God sent to Egypt back in Exodus chapter 9. Very similar. They're on a broader scale though. This will no doubt cause an agricultural crisis. Wouldn't you agree that it would do that? Look at the language there. Hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees on the earth, a third part, were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. Green grass, okay, literally garden crops were burned up. So a third part of the trees and a third part of all the garden crops on the planet were burned up. Now, folks, if you think about that and think of the fallout of something like that, this will, be, this will begin very difficult times on the earth, and this is going to lead to widespread famine. And we already saw in chapter 6, didn't we, the seal, when the seals are broken, one of the things was what? Famine was going to come upon the earth. By the way, do you see why I think these things overlap? How these things fit together? One third of the trees on earth will be burned up along with all green grass or garden crops. Now, environmentalists today are spending a lot of time on things that they have no control over or cannot save. You can devote your whole life to planting trees and having more forests to where we have more oxygen. And then God is going to come along, and in one judgment, a third of them all are going to be gone on the planet. Do you see the futility in this? Again, I'm for trees. I love trees. Just don't give me one that sheds leaves in the fall. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't have any... Well, take it. we have two really thin, scrawny-looking trees in the front of our yard, but... Um, our neighbors are, has these trees, and it's amazing. All their leaves end up in our yard. <laughs> Hopefully they're not listening to this. Be responsible. Okay. Now, folks, any one of these tragedies so far would be the worst event in history. Outside of the flood, which the world today denies anyway. 
right? The world denies the flood. The worldwide flood did take place. Noah's flood did take place. The evidence is overwhelming for anybody to see unless they refuse to see, and you can't do anything about that. However, there will be people who I think are going to see what God is doing, and they will respond in faith at that point. Not everybody, most of the world won't, but there will be those who do. Now, again, this would be the worst event in history outside of the flood. Any one of these things. Devastation. See, and that's going to affect the environment. It's going to affect the oxygen supply. Right? Because trees produce oxygen. You talk about thin air in Denver. Well, nowadays it's not thin, it's polluted with marijuana smoke. But thin air out west, nothing compared to what it's going to be like if, in fact, these things take place, and they will. Verse 8, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain, a great mountain, not a stone, a mountain, that's big, burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Again, think back to the judgments in Exodus. It literally became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. By the way, you can see very clearly here how these things go together. This second judgment, a great mountain of burning fire. You notice one-third of the sea became blood. One-third of all sea creatures died. And one-third of all the ships that were on the seas were destroyed. And that, why would that happen? Why are the ships brought into the picture? I believe because of massive tidal waves that are going to take place that will just devastate sea tra- or, or, uh, yes, the seed trade that we have on the planet. What's that going to do to commerce? Now, folks, if nothing happened except these, it would be devastating during the tribulation, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountain of waters, and the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were bitter, bitter in the sense of poisonous. This is the judgment from God. This is not some corporation throwing stuff out into the Mississippi River. This is God saying, I'm coming down on this world, okay? So we see here, number three, a great star from heaven falls on the earth and poisons the water. A third of all land waters were polluted and poisoned. A third of them, globally. One commentator says, Wormwood is a translation of the Greek word uh, absinthos and is a stupefying, often lethal plant product. The exact composition of the poisonous chemicals associated with this falling star, however, is uncertain, and certainly we would agree with that. The point, though, is this. The waters are not only polluted, they are poison, and people drink water, and massive amounts of people globally die. Many men die because of the water, okay? By the way, don't rush past that. Look at that. Many men died. Also, we see a large part of the water supply on earth through this is ruined. Folks, you can't live without air and water. I'm sorry, you just can't do it. Can we stop and think for a moment the fallout of shortages like this? But these things are going to happen. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third 
part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So number four, a third part of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Now this too will cause a shift in temperature and a shift in weather. We know that because of the nature of, of the, uh, the heat from the sun and, and the, the gravitational pulls and so forth, of the moon and, and all these different things. I'm not an astronomer, but I can tell you this, it's going to be devastating on this earth. Everything is going to be out of whack. In case you haven't realized, and I think most of you know this, okay, there is an extremely delicate balance in the universe and the distances of planets and stars and moons is in perfect, is, is exactly the way, it's a fine-tuned machine. It's not chaos. It wasn't put there by the Big Bang. It was put there by the great God. He's the one who did it. And if he decides to tweak this and do something to one of these heavenly bodies, it's going to have all kinds of things take place on the planet. How strange it will be to have such a shift in temperature and weather. And by the way, by the way, understand the 144,000 and the tribulation saints are going to be on the planet when these things are taking place. See, only time will tell what effect this will have on our planet Earth. Is this judgment a permanent condition sent from God, or is it one with temporary effects? We don't know that. Could it be that God does that and then kind of after a period of time fixes it, for lack of a, a better term, that's a poor term in light of what we're studying, but you know what I'm saying. Could it be just a temporary thing, or is it a permanent judgment that, has, that it's going to permanently be that until Jesus comes back and restores the planet? We just don't know. We just don't know. Verse 13, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. It says, wait a minute, there's only, woe, there's only, We've only talked about four of God's judgments He's pouring out on the earth. There's three more yet to come. And then the Bible's going to describe then the, 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 the vile or the bold judgments after that. Now the word woe, one lexicon says this, it's, it's, it's an interjection denoting pain or displeasure. Pain or displeasure. This is the angel's announcement. Pain or displeasure, more of it is on the way. Now, folks, when we look at what the Lord is going to do during this seven-year tribulation period, it is no wonder that the Lord Jesus Christ described it as he did. And I want you to turn there in your Bible, and I want you to look at it in your Bible and maybe highlight it or mark it or underline it. Mark chapter 13. Would you turn there with me? Mark chapter 13. Now, Matthew, of course, talks about this as well, but I, I think Mark's description is, is a little bit more stark. Mark chapter 13 and verse 19, it says, For in those days shall be affliction. That word affliction, I'm not sure why the King James translators put affliction instead of tribulation. It's the same Greek word that's found in Matthew's account of the same thing. And there it's great tribulation. Okay, it's talking about that seven-year period. Maybe because Mark is trying, or the, the translators wanted to emphasize the suffering involved during that period of time. The suffering. So I don't, I don't take pleasure on saying this. There is going to be unprecedented suffering in this world during the tribulation period. Let me tell you something. The last thing people are going to be thinking about is Pokemon. 
or the next big event that Apple's going to have, or whatever it may be. Folks, it's just not going to matter. It's just not going to matter. Survival will be the name of the game. Mark 13, 19. For in those days shall be affliction, tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created, unto this time neither shall be. Never been this bad, and it will never be that bad again. And except the Lord had shortened those days, in other words, made them a short period of time, seven years. If it was longer than seven years, nothing would be left. Look what it says. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened those days. God would have a remnant of people, okay? People who had trusted Christ the Savior, and therefore they are chosen for his purpose during that period of time. I think this could apply to the 144,000. It could apply to the ministry of the tribulation saints. Okay, don't get tripped up by things like elect and chosen. Uh, it's not a big deal, okay? The Bible talks about people elect, okay? That's referring to believers, people who trust their put their faith in Christ as their Savior. Anybody can do that. And once they've trusted Christ as Savior, God has a purpose for which He saved them. He's chosen them for a particular purpose of service. It has nothing to do with choosing certain people out of the human race to go to heaven and others to go to hell. Calvinism is a hideous doctrine. It is a perversion of the Word of God. It's also a perversion of the character of God. Okay? I was talking to somebody on the phone this, this week. They're looking for a church. This, this person lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And uh, by the way, if you know of any really good Bible-believing church there, let me know because this person has been looking. They can't find one. And they, th they said they, they, thought they, they thought they found one, and, and so they went, and, but they found out, and so they connected with the leadership in that church and the pastor and, and, and the, the person, I, I don't know if the person was listening to a message on the internet or what, one of the services, and some flags went up because this person believes like the Bible says, I was going to say like we do, but like the Bible says, that whosoever will may come. And so there was something that didn't strike this person quite right, so they asked the pastor. That's a good thing to do, by the way. Ask the pastor. If you're not sure what the pastor believes, ask the pastor. Ask the pastor. I'll tell you what I believe. I'll tell you what, I, what the scriptures say. Okay? And the pastor said this. Uh, the, the person said, now, are you a Calvinist? And the pastor says, yes, I'm a three-point Calvinist. Let me tell you something. If you're a one-point Calvinist, you've got a problem. Amen. Okay? Now, we've got a little booklet in our resource center written by the late Dr. Curtis Hudson. He says, Why I Disagree with All Five Points of Calvinism. Isn't that a great title for a booklet? I just love it. Listen, folks, it's, Calvinism is nonsense. It's nonsense. Salvation is open to all. It is the free gift of God, bought and paid for through the blood of Christ for all mankind to receive. God doesn't choose people out of the human race to be saved from hell. He says, whosoever will may come. Now, once you've trusted Christ, He has chosen you for a purpose, but even that, you have to cooperate with Him. It's not automatic. You don't become a robot once you get saved. We have free will before and after we trust Christ. It will be a seven-year period of tragedy on the earth. By the way, we've just touched the surface on the things that are coming on this planet. I, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, look at John chapter 3 with me. Would you turn there with me? See, this is something a lot of people don't, don't understand. And one of the reasons is because of the... Um, world in which we live, the press in America, the educational system in America, you know, um, everything is tolerated nowadays except Christianity. Have you ever noticed that? 
They'll build special rooms in places, workplaces and in universities and schools for the Muslims, special rooms to where they can pray. Now, I love Muslims. I, I love them. God loves them, by the way. And he wants them to be saved just like he wants everybody else to be saved through faith alone and Christ alone as God who paid for their sins and rose from the grave. But friends, if, if a Christian walked in and said, you know what, we would like a, a special room for us to pray, separation of church and state, separation of church and state, like a bunch of parrots who just, ah, separation of church and state, separate, what does that, you know, what does that mean? Uh, they don't even know what it means. Or what they tell you it means is not what it means. Okay? It's not freedom from religion, okay? It's that, the, it's that the government has no right to establish a state or federal religion. That's, that's the idea. In other words, it guarantees freedom of not only what you believe, but the exercise of what you believe. Now, I don't know if you've listened to the news recently, but Russia has passed laws now to where it is a crime for you to share your faith publicly in Russia. It's, it's a crime now. Do you understand the ramifications of something like that? Especially in light of the believer in Christ, who God has said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Wouldn't you say there's a little bit of a conflict there? That is the case, by the way, for civil disobedience. Doing it in the right way, but saying, you know what, I'm sorry. You are trying to supersede what God Almighty has said. We're going to side with God. And we as believers need to do that in our country as well. John chapter 3, look at what it says in verse 36. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath, possesses now, everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Who you believes on the Son? What does that mean? You just simply believe that Jesus was a real person of history? No, it's more than that, dear friend. The Son is, is that's a term, the Son of God, or can I put it this way? God the Son, literally, God the Son. The second person of the, of the Trinity. And what is it that we are to believe about him? Let me explain that to you, okay? By the way, what I'm about to share with you is the best news you'll ever hear, and it will not only keep you from an eternity separated from God and hell, it will also keep you from this seven-year tribulation period that we've been talking about. See, the Bible says we're all sinners. We all do things wrong. Now, you know that. You know you do things wrong, and so do I. We all do things wrong. By the way, that's not something we should be proud of. See, because when we sin, what we're doing is we have violated the Word of God. We have, we have insulted the God of heaven. We've sinned against the holy, righteous God, and we have gone against what He said. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Scripture says. To sin means to miss the mark of God's perfection. Look up here. If this was you and me, and this represents our, our sin, I know that's what it represents because it says so. See? Sin. Here we are. God loves us. He hates our sin. But the Bible says God loves us. But he hates our sin. Now, sin separates us from God. To get to heaven, we have to be without any sin whatsoever. Now, how are we going to get that way? We've already blown it, right? People say, well, I'm going to get to heaven by my good works. Well, good works don't take away the sin. You can pile a bunch of good works on yourself and say, look at me, look at me, look at all the good things I'm doing. But that doesn't take away the sin. The sin has to be gone. God can't let you into heaven with even one sin. Not even one, not even one lie, the Bible says. God says our sin has to be paid for, and if we pay for our sin, we're going to have to spend an eternity separated from God in a literal hell suffering for that sin because it is that heinous to God. But the same God who says sin must be paid for says this, I know you can't do it. 
yourself. I know you can't make the payment outside of spending forever separated from me. So what God did, because he loves us, hates our sin, but loves us and wants us to live forever with him in heaven, he himself took on flesh, became a man. God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you notice he is sinless. And when Jesus went to the cross, the reason he died on the cross, dear friend, it wasn't for something he did wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. Even Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. But the reason Jesus died was to pay for my sin, to pay for your sin. And that is what he did when he died. He took our sin upon himself. He made the complete payment for all of our sin, leaving us nothing left to pay for. And he rose from the grave to prove it was done. Now, if all your sin is gone, could you get into heaven? Yes. Yes. See, that's the greatness of what God has provided. And not only that, but he says it is a gift. It's a free gift to all who trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior. They receive that gift that moment. Look up here. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you're believing in Him. You're putting your faith in Him. You're trusting in Him that He has paid for all of your sins. And the moment you do that, your sins are forgiven and God gives you His righteousness. You go to heaven based on what Christ did for you, not what you do based on what Christ did for you. All right? Look with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. See, this is where a lot of people have a great misunderstanding because they still think they can get to heaven by their good deeds. But the Bible says, no, it's not of your works. And it's not Jesus Christ and your works. It's Jesus Christ alone. Now, let me, let me look up here for a second. Let me show you this. If Jesus Christ has done all the work, then what is left for you to do? Is there work left for you to do if Jesus Christ has done all the work? No. If Jesus Christ has paid for all the sins you've done or ever will do wrong, then what sins do you have to pay for? Well, there's none. It's simple math, right? If you commit a million sins in your life and Jesus comes and pays for all million sins, how many is left for you to pay for? Zero. Simple math. Million minus a million equals zero. Now, if you're not sure how that works, Enroll in our school. It starts on Tuesday, okay? (laughs) Here's all our lifetime of sin. Jesus comes and says, I love you so much, I don't want to spend forever not having you in my heaven. I'm going to come and I'm going to pay for your sins, and that's exactly what he did. And he says, if you trust in him that he did that for you, he gives you that moment, everlasting life. Everlasting life, everlasting. You go to heaven based on what God has done for you. I know there are people in St. Cloud who listen to this and they'll say, well, wait a minute, but I don't believe that once saved, always saved stuff. Okay, friend, let me ask you this. If you can lose your salvation, how do you lose it? What would be the cause? You know what it is? Here's what you would say. It's by you not living up to your end of the bargain. That's what you would say. Now, you may not use those terms. It's either you not living a good enough life or staying faithful in your believing, or walking with God, or all these kind of things. Well then, the way to heaven, according to you then, is you remaining faithful. That's works. Heaven is simply this. You trust in Jesus Christ that He made the payment for your sins. And when you do, the Bible says He gives you everlasting life. How long is everlasting? How long? Does it ever stop? No. How old are you? He's 15 years old. He totally gets it. Listen, I'm not trying to be rude, but here's a 15-year-old who's who's more sound on theology than many people in the pulpits today. Okay? And by the way, I could, he's he's 15, I could go to some of our elementary kids, and they're just as solid as can be. Why? Because they believe what God's Word says. Friend, if God gives you everlasting life, it's everlasting, never stops. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved. Grace is unmerited favor. 
kindness. For by grace are you saved through faith, faith in Christ. And that not of yourselves, not something you can do. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have every reason to put your faith in Him today. Friend, what I've shared with you from the book of Revelation is really going to happen. Why? God said it, He can't lie, and He's the one who controls the future. It's going to happen just the way He said. For us to say, well, I don't believe that, doesn't solve one thing. Doesn't solve it. I don't believe, oh, does that make it not true anymore because you don't believe it? No, it's true whether you believe it or not. I plead with you, though, to believe it. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.